the score one to one, one win apiece. We come to game three where Gary Kasparov is now playing the white pieces and he literally stunned us, Yasser, with one D3. Well, I think Gary Kasparov himself was stunned by the result of game two where he had lost the game and in such a spectacular fashion resigning in a drawn position and I think his confidence has really shaken. D3 is a very un -Kaspar Kasparovian type of move. Normally speaking, he would play the more aggressive E4 or D4, and D3 says to me that he's trying to get the computer out of its book and bamboozle the computer. He saw it E5, knight F3 attacking the E5 pawn, knight C6, and then the move C4, which looks like a direct transposition into an English. Knight F6, and we would have that transposition after knight C3 or G3, and Kasparov decided to try to bamboozle the computer a little bit more with the move A3. Very, very unusual move. It's not a bad move. It prepares the move B2, B4, but it's a waiting kind of move. Okay, now a couple of points here is that to start with, if black plays D5, and after C takes D5, knight takes D5, of course everyone recognizes white then has the knight or Sicilian, one of Gary's very most favorite openings, with an extra move in hand. Right. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is that even though White's opening might seem a little unusual, uh, it was specifically designed by Gary as kind of an anti-computer method, and history shows us that actually National Master David Levy in the uh, 70s, early 70s, had a bet that no computer can beat me, you know. And uh, so one, one chess program, Chess 4.7, actually took up the challenge, they played a match, uh, David Levy won three and a half, two and a half, and this was, in fact, one of the openings that he employed. So it shows that Kasparov has made a serious study of computers and computer chess history. Well, we have to understand that since the David Levy match, the computers have advanced greatly. Um, playing an anti-computer opening just for the sake of getting the computer out of its books, I'm not so sure. And let's just continue once more. We do have what you say, what you describe as Gary Kasparov's favorite um, defense. Just because it's a defense doesn't mean it's necessarily going to give him an advantage just because he has an extra move. For example, there are a lot of uh, variations with after, say, g3, and with, it, for example, a6, it's necessary for white to play b4 and both a4. So the move a3 itself may not necessarily be the most useful move. Frankly, I was a bit surprised that Gary Kasparov's ploy had worked uh, the computers, in general, uh, love open positions, so the move d5 was certainly the best move in the position. The computer chose to play d6, a little bit of a passive move. I didn't think it was that strong. So now Gary continued with knight c3, and again you pointed out that had Gary played g3, the computer would have automatically played g6. But now by playing the more clever knight c3, now the computer played bishop e7. In conjunction with d6, the bishop is rather misplaced here. In conjunction with both the d6 pawn and the knight on f6, the bishop is passive. Indeed, g6 would have been a much better move when he could fianchetto his bishop on the long diagonal. And so uh, this was a crafty play. Right, so now Gary got what he wanted. He played g3. So Computer castle. castled. Bishop g2. Bishop came to e6. We saw castles. We're still standard. And you have to understand what the strategy of Gary Kasparov is. In this particular opening, the English opening, Gary wants to control the d5 square. He does it with his pawn on c4, his knight on c3, and his lurking bishop on g2. Black, for his part, is trying to control the square d4 with the knight and the pawn. Um, very often, because we have two defenders on the d5 square, this knight on f3 has to move. A lot of times it goes away knight to d2 and jumps mm -hmm. out to e4, or sometimes even to e1 to c2 to e3 to d5. So um, the move queen d7, which was played by deep blue, is actually a mistake. Instead, it, he maybe should have played h6 to prevent this knight from leaping, and we know from the uh, analysis of a lot of English openings that the knight on f3 likes to jump anyway, so jumping with tempo makes a lot of sense for white. So, yes, queen d7 came as a surprise. Now came a bigger surprise, 
The move knight g5 just begs to be played. It's like a siren calling, play me, play me. And Gary spent about 37 minutes mm -hmm. on what I thought was an obvious move. The mm -hmm. idea of the move queen d7 is to is the strategical objective of trading this bishop for this more valued defensive and In piece. fact, normally in such a position, if you did not have knight g5 available, you might even go so far as to play rook e1 in positions like this, so that on bishop h3, you could then play bishop h1 right. and save this bishop, right? Yes? A very familiar theme in Sicilian dragons. So, in any case, finally, Gary played the move we had all expected him to play 37 minutes ago. Bishop f5, it was forced to move. And again, the strategic objective in the English opening is to control the square d5. So the move e4 was played very quickly now. Now, actually, here in the press center, you made a very good point, Yasser. You pointed out that actually knight g5 was not, quote, the move Gary was spending all this time on, but actually it was the follow-up with this kingside pawn storm that we begin to see develop after bishop g4, f3, bishop h5. This was actually, Gary was really formulating more or less his whole strategy here as opposed to just that single move, right? Exactly. And let's be clear, we've been critical of two decisions by Deep Blue. We've, we've been critical of the, the bishop being placed on e7, and we've been critical of the fact that black has not pl played h7, h6 as a tempo. So we think that white already has a built-in advantage, but how to achieve even more. And now came a critical now moment Now here he game. played knight h3. Do you think this was the best way to pursue his advantage, yes, sir? Certainly not. I would have waited for the move h7, h6. But more importantly, we know what black is trying to achieve. Black wants to control the square d4. It would have been much better for white to first preface his move uh, with bishop c1, e3, so that after a move like knight d4 captures, captures, Knight e2, attacking this pawn on c5. Now, after a move like c5, we have two key alternatives. We can come back, as in the game, preparing a pawn storm with g4 and f4, or we could jump out with knight f4, which keeps contact with that bishop. So in the game, Gary played knight h3, and now deep blue immediately jumped on the opportunity to occupy a good square in the middle of the board with his knight. Exactly. After this move, a lot of the uh, disadvantages of, of Deep Blue's position um, aren't so relevant. The bishop on e7 isn't so bad anymore. The fact that you haven't played h7, h6 is no longer relevant. So now Gary played knight f2. And it, it really is somewhat hard to imagine that against a human opponent, Gary just backpedaling like this. No, it's something you're not going to see from Gary, the voluntary retreat. He doesn't do it often. So the computer played h6 kind of creating lift and making a hole for his bishop. Uh, this was an interesting decision, by the way, because what White is trying to achieve is he wants to make a pawn storm on the king side. He can do it with the moves g3, g4, followed by h2, h4. He also wants to try to get in the, in the move f3, f4. So the move h7, h6 was, in some interesting way, a recognition by Deep Blue that somewhere in its horizon it saw that this pawn storm was a possibility and took a preventive measure. Okay, so now Gary played bishop e3, but a couple of moves later than we would have liked to have seen it. And this is a crucial difference. The e5 pawn supports the knight on d4, d4 but now with the move c7, c5, it's doubly uh, protected. Well, Gary tries to deflect the c-pawn, but Deep Blue naturally meets him at the pass. Now Gary puts his rook on the potentially open file with rook b1, and here the computer played another computer move. Yes. King h8. Well, computer operators actually describe this move as a null move. N-U-L-L -L means a nothing move, or rather even to pass. Deep Blue has perceived that its, its pieces are well placed, and it doesn't want to damage its position, and so it chooses to make a null move. I had predicted before the match that if Gary Kasparov ever got the computer to play a move like King G8, H8, for no visible reason, the so-called null move, then his strategy was a success. Now here Gary played Rook B2, which at the time looked reasonable if he can build up on the king side. The Rook has lateral possibilities as well as queen to here to double behind it, but you said you didn't really like rook b2 so much, yes? No, in fact, I was disgusted by the move. 
Um, the, the move king h8 is such a, a poor move, this, this null pass. Uh, white needs to do something active. And we've been seeing that throughout this match that Gary has been very, very reluctant to take that sword and to charge down the board. In this position, what he needs to do is he wants to try to occupy the square d5 at the same time get that pawn storm on the king side going. He's got an ideal opportunity to do that. And if we look at the position for a moment, the ideal way is to play h2, h3. The concept being that the knight on f2 is ready to jump out onto the g4 square in order to trade on f6 so that this knight can come. Uh, just to put it in perspective, let's, let's, give the let's make a bad move for the computer. Well, let's make two bad moves for the computer. I beg your pardon. Let's suggest that after h3, king goes back to g8, knight goes to g4, bishop goes back to g6. Two bad moves for the computer, mind you. We're just making bad moves with him. Now we see the idea. f3, f4, and white has the ideal formation. A pawn storm on the king, on the king side, at the same time the opportunity to win the d5 square. Well, coming back to my view, h3 meets all the obligations of the of the, the position requires you get your pawn storm you get your d5 square everything is happening i really was disgusted by the move rook b2 i thought it was a bad move and now one sign of the computer's real strength as we've discussed before is the computer takes each position as it is doesn't worry about how it arrived there and tries to play the best move. And here the computer played a6, which you said you really liked. Of course, I didn't like the move king h8, but at the same time, I did like the move a6. The move a6 prepares counterplay on the queen side with the move b6, b5. Clearly, black isn't making play on the, on the king side. He's not making play in the center because of the block formation. He's got to do it on the queen side. This was a good move. So Gary respected that move, played b takes c5. Another disgusting move by Gary. Um, Again, he's being faced with a situation where he has to react or even act on the king side. He shouldn't be touching the queen side at all. Uh, B takes c5 only opened up the queen side, not to his advantage, but to that of his opponents. Again, the move h2, h3 was right. After b takes c5, b takes c5, I really began to question Gary's... Now he followed it up by sending the queen with bishop h3 over to the queen side. Yes. Um, the move bishop h3 also was a strange move in my view, but um, it had its points, and that was that the bishop on g2 wasn't doing so much, and so now after queen c7, bishop g4, at least he had activated his bishop. So the computer avoided this exchange with bishop back. Should do. Uh, remember, yes, we need to have the king on h8. Exactly. Okay? So after bishop g4, bishop back to g6. Now Gary went ahead and played f4, but somehow it doesn't have the same punch now that he's opened up the queen side. Well, two things are wrong with this move now. He has, in fact, opened up the queen side, so, so deep blue gets its counterplay there. At the same time, because the pawn on e5 is still on the board, this exchange of pawns on the f4 square reduces the the advantage of the pawn storm. So in fact, deep blue does exchange pawns. e takes f4, e takes f4. And now, with queen a5, takes full advantage of the counterplay that uh, Gary offered him. It's been offered, it's uh, been accepted. Attacks the knight on c3, and the pawn here. So, of course, knight b1 would defend both, but this is absolutely not Gary style. No. Even against deep thought, right? Even against deep blue. Like, Bishop, Bishop d2, protecting the knight. Deep blue grabbed the pawn. And now I was disgusted yet again. This was a moment that really mystified us. Absolutely. Um, Gary Kasparov is known as a magician, an attacking dynamo. He loves to activate his pieces. He pounces on his opponent's position. And he's got the perfect opportunity. Let's have a look. Of course, Gary should be activating his rook with the move rook on b2 to b7. After a four sequence like bishop on e7 to d8 f4 to f5, and in my view, has still maintained his advantage. Instead, we saw a wholly unpredictable move by Gary Kasparov. He saw a very passive move instead, rook on b2 to a2. And to, to try to explain this move to my audience was virtually impossible. 
Garry Kasparov sacrifices a pawn in order to force an exchange of queens with a passive with a passive rook on a2 made no sense. Yes, this was remarkable. So after queen b3, f5, the computer exchanges on d1, Gary takes with the bishop, the computer hides his bishop back on h7, now he can later play g6. The other possibility is bishop h5, but basically from this point on, it became a question of Gary has some compensation for the pawn. Clearly. But I also felt to some degree that the computer has a kind of position where, hey, I have a pawn, prove it. Well, indeed, uh, the computer should be very happy. It started the game with a disadvantage. It played poorly some moves, a, a number of moves, in fact. Now it's in an end game upon up. I'd be very happy that to have bailed out. One of Gary's advantages is the square for his knight, so he starts to send one toward it with the idea knight f4 to d5. Computer plays rook at f to b8. Rook's on open files. Very sensible. And Gary continues with knight f4. Now the computer plays bishop d8. I thought that was a wrong move, quite frankly. In my view, uh, deep blue has an advantage. Uh, had I been playing black's position, I would have chosen the move knight on d4 to c6 with two very clear ideas in mind. The first idea is that by bringing my knight to b4, I attack the pawn on d3, I attack the rook on a2, and I make it possible to advance my pawn. Also, by bringing my knight back to c6, I can jump to the e5 square, which is a very nice square, to attack the pawn. Had Gary played a natural sequence of moves, like knight d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, I could have further done what I, what I would, could only hope to do, which is to play bishop g5, achieving a, an exchange of, of bishops, so that when my knight goes either to e5 or to b4, in my view, it's very clear Deep blue mm -hmm. has an advantage. Clear advantage. No question about it. Mm -hmm. Instead, we saw bishop d8, and this was a poor choice. So after knight at f to d5, now knight to c6 was played. Yes, because now, uh, instead of making a voluntary choice of a retreat, the computer realizes he has to block the move bishop d2 to f4. Which happens, and it, now he blocks it, as he said, knight e5. And now Gary played interesting move, bishop a4. Well, what else do you want Gary to do with the bishop? The bishop on d1, although it eyeballs the king's side, there's nothing happening on the king's side. So the move bishop a4 blockading the a6 pawn made a lot of sense. Now, of course, if he tries to take the d3 pawn, then, then he becomes very active. Indeed. Knight takes d3, bishop takes d6. And with the possibility of e4, e5, this mm -hmm. opens up the floodgates for white's pieces. Mm -hmm. So after bishop a4, he exchanged on d5, took with the knight, and now the computer played a5. And if there is one thing that Gary learned from this, is that the computer, with a material advantage, will go to great lengths to hold on to it. And so this might be something that Gary, in fact, has already used, and will probably continue to try and use. Exactly. Uh, the material advantage in this moment isn't so meaningful, and this move, in fact, a5 is a mistake. Um, the pawn can be forced to the a5 square, but by leaving it on a6, we do control the b5 square. Uh, my suggestion in the commentary room was for f6, rook on a, f1 to a1, bishop back to g8, activating that bishop at last. Now, after the move, bishop on a4 to b5, bishop takes, e takes, you must recapture, of course, with the e4 pawn, and now a5, and black has just an absolutely solid blockade, there is no way he's going to lose the game, it may be very difficult for deep blue to win the game, but there's no chance for him to lose it. Now after a5, bishop b5, Gary Kasparov could block the b pile and have a nice game. So rook a7. King g2. Now the computer played g5, lashing out. Well, um, one of the computer's algorithms uh, states to the computer that pawns should be pushed virtually at all times. So it's very common to see the computer push pawns in front of the, his king even when they're weakening moves. Uh, the move g5 is wrong for several reasons, and Gary found one of them. Okay, well, Gary in the game, he took 
And after pawn takes, he played this very, very powerful move, f7, f6. Optically, if you look at the board for just a moment, you'll realize that this bishop on d8 is now dead. It faces an absolute dead end on the queen side and the king side. So this pawn, combined with this knight, uh, keeps this bishop in a kind of a prison. Actually, if white just had one more pawn like over there somewhere and had this protected, it would really be beautiful. Indeed, over on the, over on the king side. But the problem is white is still a pawn down. That's right. So in the game, black now activates his bishop, quote, activates it. Now Gary plays h4 to try and open up against the uh, isolated king over here. After g takes h4. It's important by the way that we note that it's necessary to take this pawn. It's not a pawn that you want to take, but for example, if the move g5, we'll see the move h5. Bishop takes h5. Rook h1. And then suddenly. Has to go back. Rook takes rook check. Takes. King has to go. And then king g3. And suddenly there's this beautiful shift uh, in the position of rook um, a2, h2, and you'll be mated. And you can't even run away because... It's mate right away. Now Gary played king h3. Sensibly regaining his, his uh, sacrifice pawn. King g8. King h4. And now the computer kind of went into a show-me mode. Exactly. And that's Gary's problem. Gary has a beautiful position. His pieces are ideal. His minors especially. Bishop on b5, knight on, on d5. But it's very hard to squeeze anything further from the position. He's a pawn down, and although he's got great compensation for the pawn, he doesn't have enough well, to Well, the first target was he tried to go for his h-file formation with king g4. Very sensible, preparing a rook shift. And actually, this is rather serious. If the computer continues to pass, for example, rook here, here, back, can we actually play something like rook takes check? No, this is too ambitious. Uh, but what we can do, yes, sir, is we can double rooks instead. Well, after rook h1, king no, h7, rook a2, h2, double And then on rooks. check, then we simply play up. And, and then And now some, there's some always danger. the possibility of uh, rook takes h5 combined with moving our knight into e7. Uh, white's in no danger of losing because he can always bail out with a repetition. Mm hmm but uh, this is a position that Deep Blue would have to be careful. Yeah, I liked what Deep Blue did here, playing bishop here, because the threat now is to play bishop d6 to f8 and just absolutely keep everything. Right. So uh, Gary went ahead and took this with knight takes c7. A controversial decision, but I think it was the correct one. After capturing the bishop, Gary regains his pawn. Um, he's no longer a pawn down. He still keeps a lot of his uh, positional trumps. So it's a reasonable attempt to try to win the game by capturing the bishop. But nonetheless, after, after this capture and rook takes, and rook takes a5, it was pretty clear to everyone that the game would be a draw, right? Yes? Yes. The problem is that now the pawn on d3 is vulnerable to an attack on the open file. If this bishop could magically transform port itself to the d5 square, I think white's advantage would be serious. But because of this open d file, um, black always has plenty of counterplay against the g d3 pawn. Uh, deep blue played rook d8 after rook takes a5, I believe. Yes, immediately attacking Gary's weakness. He played rook f3, king h8. One of those null moves. King h4. King to g8. Now Gary played rook to a3, king h8, rook a6. Now this does have the idea of relocating the bishop to d5, as you were saying. Right. But the computer showed that this isn't even a threat, simply ignored him, because on bishop c6, he can simply play rook d6, and that's the end of that idea. Forcing the exchange of rooks. So bishop c6 wasn't possible. Gary so chose rook a3. And after king h8, rook a6, they did, in fact, agree to a draw. A poor game. Considering the quality of the first two games, uh, bad play by both sides, a deserved re a result, one and a half, one and a half after three.